Greetings. My name is Alvaro Ibarra. I currently teach art history in the Department of Art and Design at Utah State University. In this video, I will be re-presenting a lecture delivered on March 6, 2020 at the Leonardo, part of the museum's lecture series associated with Pompeii, the exhibition. But before to live and die in Pompeii can be presented in this format, we must address a few legal matters. The contents of this video are exclusively for educational purposes. The images are incorporated according to free use policies. Exclusive rights belong to the owners of the properties displayed herein. No profit was accrued from this educational endeavor. The author only claims copyright on the textual and oral material in this production. The author gives the Leonardo permission to present this production for a nonprofit educational community outreach program serving Salt Lake City and Utah. So with that out of the way, Let's get on with the show. This lecture is a day in the life narrative of an ordinary Pompeian. It encapsulates his daily routine punctuated by a few exceptional occurrences. Whenever possible, artifacts from the Pompeii exhibition were inserted in order to make this reconstruction more tangible. Albeit fictional, the story is based on plausible happenings, those rooted in the textual and material evidence concerning ancient Pompeii. Citations are noted throughout the PowerPoint for verification and edification. And by way of warning, there are some adult themes and violence. Finally, there is one very self-indulgent use of magical realism at the end, so be warned. It is the spring of AD 55, four years before the bloody ride in the amphitheater, 17 years before the great earthquake of 62, and a quarter century prior to the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. Not a year has passed since the death of Claudius and the ascension of Nero, Claudius, Caesar, Augustus, Germanicus, called Nero. The Roman citizenry is optimistic. His eccentricities endear him to commoners. His deference toward the Senate pleased the aristocracy. Nero's economic initiatives spark hope in the rich and the poor alike. Pompeii has a population of around 20 to 25,000. Serving as Rome's primary import-export hub, Pompeii is, like every great port city, diverse, cosmopolitan, corrupt, exciting, and dangerous. Tremendous wealth and abject poverty exist side by side. In Roman Pompeii, if you're born in the gutter, you're going to die in the gutter. If you are born rich, you're going to die richer. Our protagonist, Publius Comicius Restitutus, belongs to the patrician class, elite in name only but hope springs eternal for ambitious individuals. Publius is a Roman citizen of note. His grandfather Publius Comicius Metellus soldiered with Sulla when they battered down the walls of Pompeii in the Social War. Metellus remained and profited from investments with drovers from here to Samnite country. Metellus' son, Publius Comicius Balbus, foolishly squandered his inheritance. Called restitutus by his mother, the burden of restoring Gens Comicius was squared on the shoulders of our present Publius. And such a burden is undertaken one day at a time. 
It's near dawn. The cubiculum is nearly pitch black, but Publius can feel the coming of Aurora. The chill of the spring morning penetrates the thick walls, making the surface of the frescoes sweat from the brazier's heat. In the corner of the chamber, Publius focuses on the dying embers therein. This cubiculum is too big, Publius muses. It used to be part of his grandfather's beautiful office at Tablinum, his father tore into, to build a bigger banqueting space. That damn triclinium proved a useless waste to Balbus. Before Publius could further brood on the architectural history of his home, there is a gentle rapping at the door. It creaks open, and a head makes a tentative foray into the cubiculum. Publius sits up in his sleeping couch and gestures for his body slave, Moose, to enter. Moose goes about lighting lamps around the bedchamber. He stokes the embers in the brazier. He sets a table before Publius. There's a large aretine bowl filled with fresh water. Moose spreads a toiletry kit of bronze tools before his master. Publius declines the dental routine this morning. A paste of ash and ground ox hoof wash down with urine. Moose diligently plucks at his master's beard and applies a balm to Publius' scalp before styling the latest quaff. To gauge his master's satisfaction, Moose procured a mirror from his mistress's toilette. Vanity was not a trait esteemed by Romans, but today was an important day for Publius, and he can't be looking like a common muleteer. Next, Publius takes his breakfast near the Fornus, where it's warm. Household slaves labor at stoking the hearth and preparing food. Moose leaves to make sure the bodyguard and accounting slaves are ready to depart on their master's order. The meal consists of leftover bread, corn gruel, and some heated wine to fortify him against the chill of the morning air. Publius eats alone. His wife and child slumber on. Publius leaves home as the sun peaks over the horizon. He is accompanied by the Greek slave that keeps his accounts in order and a Gaulish slave that keeps his enemies at bay. Publius and his companions make their way down the wide avenues. Fellow Pompeians shuffle sleepily toward market. The noise of car... Depending on Polybius' hangover, Publius could be stuck on his patron's doorstep for hours. His frustration escalates, remembering that Polybius has ambitions of becoming the chief municipal officer of Pompeii. The thought of that overstuffed bladder as duoir is preposterous to Publius. Patrician in name only, purchased in gold, that Samnite go goat was no member of the Julii clan. It was positively absurd. And just as Publius felt his fury crescendo, his ill will evaporates as he reaches for the doorbell. It was a new bronze team Tinabulum. A giant phallus with lion haunches. Togging, tugging on the big member was an old joke. It was a dumb joke. Publius' smile betrays him, and any hope he harbored to blast Polybius with the evil eye is foiled. Fortuna smiles on the meek this morning. The large door opens almost immediately to reveal Croisos standing in the Falcis. Polybius's social secretary greets his master's client and gestures him toward the atrium. The Greek and the Gaul remain outside. Once inside, Publius sees his patron seated in the tablinum, engaged with another visitor, a stranger. 
Croesus jerks Publius from his contemplation with a well-rehearsed spiel on the quality of the mosaics. The frescoes uh, were still a work in progress. Master Gaius was in the process of replacing the drab old works with something more contemporary. Master Gaius likes the current fad. The dark and moody compositions were easily balanced with frivolous embellishments. But Master's artist, ahead of the guild anyway, claimed there was something new on the horizon. He posits it will be bright and buoyant, a proper whitewash of the current style. Croesus apologizes for waxing philosophically about aesthetics, a field beyond his capacity and training. Pausing, Croesus points dramatically at the display of busts in the adjacent ala. Most were in the old style, prunish portraits of Polybius's ancestors. Only one face possessed a youthful vigor. Done in the new style, still, they all looked newly minted to Publius. Mercifully, his patron's booming voice beckoned, interrupting a lecture on the lauded and likely fabricated biographies of Polybius's dead relatives. Entering the tablinum, the two men greet each other formally. The other visitor, the stranger, is now gone. No pleasantries are exchanged. In the typical formula for the salutatio, the client informs the patron on the performance of current investments. The patron communicates desired changes in the ongoing investment strategy to the client. And then, awkward silence. Publius breaks the silence first, requesting funds for the purchase of additional land outside Nocera. Publius has convinced the drover's guild there to join his firm. Before Polybius can whinge about the sum, Publius relates that the largest percentage go to the regional overseer of the Latifundia. Land is cheap. Bribes are expensive. Polybius acquiesces. However, in return, he asks for a small favor from his client. He wants Publius to murder the edel Gaius Cuspius Panza. Poison is the best route, the patron surmises. Another awkward silence. Publius likes Panza. He's a legitimate patrician a war hero, an honest servant to the people of Pompeii. Such traits disqualify you for public office, which is probably why Panza left Rome. Gens Cuspius was not a wealthy family, so Panza struggled as a financial secretary of the city. He tried to do things right. Publius could see why folks wanted him dead. Nothing left to be said. Polybius was not making a request. The client rises from his seat to traverse the expanse of his patron's atrium toward the front door. He contemplates the, the remainder of the day, amending plans for this new and horrible task. Publius and his two slaves make their way down the long avenue toward the forum. The diminutive Greek trails while the big Gaul whacks playfully at beggars with a large wooden rod just ahead of his master. A dark cloud hangs above Publius. It wasn't the killing that troubled him. He killed men before for honor, for pleasure, for profit. However, assassinating a politician was messy business, especially a man like Panza. Arriving at the Forum, Publius turns to look at the facade of the Temple of Jupiter, the Capitolium. He says a prayer under his breath and hopes that Jove will benevolently oversee today's transactions. The city is fully awake by this hour. The Forum is filled with itinerant merchants screaming the price of their wares. 
some priest of Kibili process under the honorific arch, banging their drums incessantly. The air wafts a pungent mixture of manure, baking bread, grilled meat, and that sticky sweet odor of rotting fruit. Publius recalls the list he committed to memory. In his mind's eye, a plan of the forum is made manifest. Temple of Apollo, Basilica, Curia, Machaelum. He mouths his destinations like a mantra. And now this new business, the baths for certain, a colleague wouldn't a colleague there would know the right pulpina gods this was going to take all day. The three maneuver toward the sacred precinct of Apollo. The temple of Apollo is ringed by a covered colonnade. People were already gathered at the altar fronting the temple. Relatives came on behalf of the moribund. Artists begged for divine inspiration. Others sought the oracular gifts of the far darter. Polybius sent the Greek to arrange an appointment with the Aeditus. He'd given him some coin to help make it snappy. Waiting, Publius leans against a pedestal that elevates the bronze statue of Apollo, his gilt skin glowing in the morning sun. The gold arrow upon the silver bow is aimed at some unseen adversary, perceived only by the shell and lapis eyes of the distant deadly archer. After what felt like an eternity, one of the priests comes over to Publius. Publius pays the pontiff to have a goat sacrificed to Apollo on behalf of his son's education. They negotiate an appropriate incantation, the prayer written down on a lead tablet for the sake of accuracy. The price was steep, but Publius needed guidance. His son was getting too old for the grammaticus. Hire a rhetor, buy a rhetor, or send a boy to oratory school in Rome. His mother would never allow that, and rhetors were expensive. At that instance, Publius secretly vowed a vow to Apollo in the shadow of his statue, just in case the priests didn't fulfill their end of the transaction. You could never be sure these days. It might not be a goat, but what Publius promises could be something far more valuable to a god. A fair exchange to see his son become fully and truly restitutus. His next order of business was across the street in the fairly new city basilica. Its cavernous interior was filled with traders and money changers. A few collegia communed here and there. Up on the tribunal, there was a case being tried. It was something or other about property damages. Publius ignores the din that echoes through the chamber as he snakes his way toward the regular location of a slave auctioneer he held in high esteem. Today, Publius arranges to buy a new Greek tutor. Deciding an in-house rhetor is the best course of action. Thanks be to Apollo. The auctioneer promises Publius to acquire a real Greek scholar unless he'd prefer the Syrian tutor in stock. Publius declines. He can wait. Maneuvering toward the tribunal, Publius sees the current duo ear seated in his days. Various edels gather round as well, all intensely listening to the ongoing litigation. Panza is among the group, and Publius feels a sudden pang of guilt. Guilt be damned. Catching the eye of one of the aides to the Edel of Markets, the two men convene behind a column and away from the tribunal. As a favor to his patron, Gaius Julius Polybius, might the Edel see to an increase in the price of Egyptian corn. His patron, Sicilian grain, is superior and far more secure a source, he might argue. The aide 
promises to appeal the claim at 4% plus the usual donation. Publius agrees to pass along the latest stipulation. Finally, Publius finds a solicitor for advice on his neighbor's insula blocking light from coming into his home. The recent building of an extra uh, floor atop the apartment structure is the problem. The solicitor informs Publius that the construction is illegal and that, he, then that he should register an official complaint with the Curia. On the south side of the Forum, opposite the Temple of Jupiter, sit three blunt epsidal halls that make up the municipal offices of Pompeii. Just outside the entrance to the Hall of Records was an honorific statue of a prior dual weir. The identity uh, eludes Polybius, largely because the portrait is so utterly Claudian. Whichever magistrate it purportedly represents, Publius was certain he was about as Claudian as his own patron was a member of the Julia. What sycophants. Inside, Publius files his complaint with a clerk and is promised to receive word on the matter as soon as possible. Poised against a slumlord with a million sesterces insula, Publius is not especially hopeful for an expedited outcome. His garden will wither in shadow, his family will choke from the black smoke of illegal fires. After a long morning of business, Publius is starving. So he makes his way to the taberna of the freedom uni freedmen Unianis. Inside the establishment, Publius peruses the offering. Something akin to his breakfast porridge, a vegetable and bean stew, different flavored cakes and pies, fresh bread. Publius greets the wife of Unianus and orders a stew and eats at the counter. A serving boy takes bread to the Greek and the Gaul, seated on the street curb. All three wolf down their prandium, Publius pausing briefly to indulge in a cup of wine. Publius's last stop is the Machaelum, the main market. At the Machaelum, Publius buys the meats and other foodstuffs for this evening's banquet. Some fresh suckling pigs, quail eggs, and honey for the wine. Some local campanian would be enough for his clients, but tonight some narbo wine will impress his guests. He sends these goods home with the Greek. The Gaul remains. At the conclusion of the business day, grimy from the sandy sea breeze, Publius decides to visit the forum baths. But hygiene is not his main motivation. He was on a dirty errand. In the apoditarium, Publius leaves the Gaul to guard his clothes. He will save him the indignity of having to go from bodyguard to body slave. Gauls are a prideful people, and even a Gaulish slave still preserves some semblance of dignity. More selfishly, Publius feared the brute might, might inadvertently skin him alive with the strigil. The baths employ trained slaves with a lighter touch. He allows a lascivious thought on a new attendant he spied last week to linger. Shaking his head, Polybius focuses on the task at hand. He loiters in the tepidarium in anticipation of the arrival of Saturninus the Fixer. Saturninus is a freedman, but no one knew of a farmer master, renowned for having no compunction. He works at whatever deed for whatever patron. Luckily, all Publius needed today was some information. Saturninus's scheduled arrival was not ritual. It was not habit. The fixer makes his rounds, facilitating his availability to those that prefer less conspicuous run-ins. Happenstance is a valuable commodity among the city's, city's most ambitious citizenry. The two men exchange pleasantries in the tepidarium. From a distance, no one would hazard to guess the topic of conversation is murder. Saturninus gives Publius options. 
the less is known, the better for everyone involved. Um, a robbery gone wrong. Jealous lover. Food poisoning. Saturninus had a man, knew a man, or knew a man who knew a man. A future favor, not coin, is exchanged for the information. Publius thanks Saturninus, promptly completes his bathing, dresses, and leaves the bathhouse in the company of his Gallic bodyguard. The contact Saturninus relayed was for later. It was too early for Cana, and Publius didn't feel like loitering at home. He might have appointments with his own clients. His wife would have complaints about the slaves. His son would be done with his studies and want to play. He remembers the upcoming gladiator spectacle. The fighters are on display at the palestra. From the forum baths, Publius takes a leisurely stroll past the entertainment district. From outside, you can hear an orator practicing in the Odeon, wishing to steer clear of any run-ins with Polybius. Publius walks out the Porta Stabia and re-enters the city at Porta Nocera. He ponders the tombs of the necropolis outside Porta Nocera. The dead stare back and beckon Publius to linger. Marble busts animated in encaustic paint, inscription giving voice in perpetuity. Publius muses on whether he should commission his own family tomb soon. Come, stranger, stay and mourn at the grave of Publius Comicius Restitutus, Idol, Duoir, Imperator Optimus Maximus. He smirks at the absurdity of his imaginary epitaph. From the necropolis, Publius proceeds to the palestra. The local gladiator, Familia, is indeed on display in the open-air gymnasium. A few of them are exercising, lifting strength stones or wrestling. Another group stands together and flex their muscles for onlookers. A wooden plaque around their neck relates name and style. Okeanus, Thracian, Albanus, Retiarius. Publius places a bet on a gigantic marmillo named Tulip. He's had two losses, so the bookmaker offers good odds. The crowd offered Misus on both occasions. Publius feels Tulip is due for a win, and he could certainly use the windfall from a victory. Publius backtracks to the entertainment district. The Popina, recommended by Saturninus, is in this neighborhood. The bar is one of those illegal affairs, here today, gone tomorrow. If they don't cause trouble, the authorities don't shut them down. Publius is early again. He orders wine from the barmaid, Valerian, not that paint they sell to drunks. She departs with his order. Publius distracts himself with a game of dice. Uh, there's always a degenerate gamer around, and he can afford to lose a few asses on wine and dice. Publius considers another distraction to pass the time, but decides against it. He contends himself with viewing the image, a gift from Venus. His attention shifts back to business when his contact enters, right on time, another convenient happenstance. Just as Saturninus described, the man is short, stocky, powerfully built. He wears a tunic dyed in Tyrian purple. They make eye contact, a potential contract implicit in the intense exchange. The purple stranger tilts his head, his eyes darting to the stairs. The stairs lead to a cubiculum, an equally illegal room for rent. Small, clean. Publius stands at the door while the man sits on the couch. The only name exchanged is Saturninus. Publius makes his request, Nightshade. A passing joke is made about Locusta, the supreme apothecary to the emperor. A price is named, a lot of coin is exchanged. 
On the wooden chest, mysterious powders reside in terracotta bowls. On a tiny table, variously sized glass vessels contain liquids in manifold color. The stranger reaches for a tiny one no bigger than his thumb and hands it to Publius with instructions. Nightshade has many properties and the procurer has no interest in knowing the intended use. Publius leaves the popina, collecting his gall at the entryway. He guesses at the purple stranger's backstory, a medicus that lost too many patients, an apothecary with dreams of a seaside villa. After that, Publius' thoughts gravitate toward plotting the demise of Panza as he ambles home. The Gaul gleefully cudgels anyone that gets in the way. Publius is barely through the Falcis before fielding a barrage from his wife, Lucretia. The kitchen slave needs a good beating. Their son is failing his studies. Five clients came for appointments with their patron. And a planned cana with the neighbors is now cancelled because Gaius Julius Polybius sent him a last-minute invitation to banquet. Publius is suddenly in a panic. Why didn't Polybius invite him earlier? Why did he send them on this late errand? He's going to be late. What in Hades could this unexpected honor be all about? Did his patron see the genius in his Nocera scheme, perhaps? Lucretia interrupts his flailing thoughts. All that food is going to waste, and that narble wine, the wine. He'd present the narble vintage to Polybius, along with the nightshade. No, not like that. He permits himself to indulge in the perverse fantasy only slightly. Fortuna be praised. This is the break he had anticipated for so long, laboring under the thumb of Polybius without complaint, without reproach. Polybius scrambles to his cubiculum, yelling for the body slave, Moose, where is Moose? Lucretia throws her hands up in exasperation of her starry-eyed husband. Moose emerges with his master's best toga, pressed and chalked to brilliant whiteness. Another slave struggles to wrap the woolen outfit ar around her master properly. Publius even concedes to the dental paste, holding his nose for the urine rinse. Moose assures him it is the highest quality urine, directly from the Palatine in Rome. A bit of scented oil, and his servants declare their dominus ready for the Senate House. No time for doubt. Back in the atrium, Lucretia offers every prayer for his success. She extends a cup of wine for him to gargle before offering a farewell kiss. Insisting on Publius taking additional bodyguards at this hour, her husband declares the Gaul is more than capable. With the Gaul hoisting the amphora of Narbo wine, the retinue sets out in search of a greater destiny for Gens Comicius. On their hurried march to the house of Gaius Julius Polybius, Publius allows himself to indulge in thoughts of a high-ranking appointment in Pompeii, a villa in Herculaneum, new garments for Lucretia, a, a real Greek philosopher for his son. Having to carry the amphora, the Gaul leads the way with a torch in the other hand, a bit sad to be apprehending the coming darkness rather than bashing beggars. In the Fauces of Polybius' home, Croesus motions Publius towards the triclinium where the festivities are underway. In the banqueting hall, seven dinner guests and their host recline on couches. The position of honor remains open, to which Publius felt against his will a sense of pride. Publius bows to the group, presenting the Narbo vintage by way of apology. Murmurs of approval show his tardiness is forgiven. A servant takes the amphora. 
Polybius rises from his couch, traverses the triclinium, and embraces Publius. Client palms the vial of nightshade to patron. They exchange expressions that very nearly mimic fondness. Publius forces the approximation of a smile. Suddenly, Polybius elevates his arm to command attention. He says he fears the gracious and generous Publius cannot stay. At that moment, Panza enters the triclinium, yet another slave taking his cloak. Publius musters every bit of his will to restrain showing evidence of shock or surprise. The Edel nods at Publius in passing as he occupies the honorific post. The guests stumble over one another to greet Panza. Only Polybius casts one final disparaging glance at him as if to say, still here. Publius and the Gaul are enveloped by the night as the ostium closes behind them. He fights to quiet his mind to figure out what just happened. They meander through the streets, the Gaul holding the torch aloft for his master, but Publius isn't paying attention. He needs to get home. He needs to get off the street. He needs more than one damned bodyguard. Suddenly, the Gaul's torch explodes in a shower of sparks. The street is plunged into darkness. Publius's eyes struggle to adjust. The clack of hobnails on cobblestones all around, he flails wildly at the blackness. Disoriented, he struggles to decide whether to run, fight, or plead for his life. A muffled cry comes from... Thus, Publius Comici Restitutus leaves our world. But before Publius can go to wherever souls go, Hades maybe, the far darter, fair Apollo, must maintain his end of a transaction. This morning, Publius promised Apollo the ultimate sacrifice, human sacrifice. Because the gods don't always listen, Mortals forget the complexity of dealing with the divine. However, the life of Gaius Cuspius Panza was not for Publius to give, so Apollo accepted the only life Publius had to offer. A bit of oracular insight into the future was a fair trade, Apollo concluded. Publius had held up his end of the bargain, dying for the restoration of his son. And in a sudden gesture of magnanimity, Apollo decided to grant the whole of Pompeii this favor in return for such rare fare. The entire city would be preserved, buried like a treasure. It would be unearthed, and it would be restored by mortals in the distant future. Pompeii will become one of the most famous cities in the world, and millions will make the pilgrimage. They will come to pay homage to the sacrifice Publius Comicius Restitutus made to Apollo. They will come and stare in awe at the body miraculously restored by the very cinders and ash that incinerated his flesh, the son of the father, both aptly named Restitutus. <laughs>